I sometimes find when you start uh, speaking as well, it has this magical effect of <laughs> bringing people, uh, people in. So sometimes I find in uh, my lectures in, uh, in Dublin. Okay, in the um, first lecture, I was looking at this, as I said, a very contemporary moment, this uh, translational politics of immigration. Uh, in the lecture yesterday, we're moving back to the uh, 16th century and seeing how many of uh, our contemporary concerns uh, can be traced or tracked back to that uh, period. Um, what I'm going to do today is to situate arguments or questions about translation in terms of a body of uh, thinking that is exercising a lot of minds uh, today in, in cultural studies and uh, other uh, areas. And that is the whole notion of the cosmopolitan and cosmopolitanism. And what I want to kind of uh, argue, and again this is sort of speculative, it's, 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 it's hypothetical, and that's why I look forward to the debate uh, afterwards, is to offer perhaps a different take on cosmopolitan uh, thinking and using or linking that then to specific episodes from the translation uh, history of, uh, of my own uh, country, but I think the parallels with other countries will be, uh, will be quite, quite obvious. And finishing up then with looking at the notion of the local, the notion of uh, mobility, in terms of what I'm going to call uh, dynamic uh, rootedness and what dynamic rootedness means or the implications of it uh, for thinking about uh, translation. So I wanted to um, begin this afternoon's uh, session by uh, examining what is understood or what has historically been understood as the notion of cosmopolitanism. Um, it was said that it was the Greek philosopher uh, Diogenes who was the first uh, person to uh, define himself in the 4th century BC as a citizen of the uh, world. Um, another uh, Greek uh, thinker, a man called uh, Aristippus, put this in a slightly more colourful way when he said that any point on the globe was the same distance from Hades, was the same distance from the, uh, on, on the uh, underworld. When the citizenship of the city of Zurich was offered to Erasmus in 1552 by Zwingli, uh, Erasmus said in response to Zwingli, turning down the offer of citizenship, that I want to be not a citizen of one single city, but of the whole world. So the notion, if you like, of humanity as a collection of uh, free and equal uh, human beings, possessing the same basic uh, rights, and where notions of hospitality, of openness to others, um, of freedom of movement uh, are uh, primordial, that this kind of uh, ideal, this kind of utopia, is still a notion that underlies a great deal of our contemporary and current thinking about intercultural uh, relations, the importance of uh, translation in the contemporary world, and uh, so on. I want to, in particular to focus on uh, one book um, that was uh, published originally in uh, German by a man called Peter Kulmas, uh, which is translated into French and Spanish, and just last year into uh, English. But it's a book called uh, Weltbürger, which is uh, Kulmas' history, if you like, of cosmopolitanism and thinking about cosmopolitanism, first published, let's say, in uh, 1990. Um, Kulmas is very clear in his introduction to the book. Um, he is deeply uh, sympathetic to the cosmopolitan uh, ideal or set of ideals, and he feels that any movement away from the cosmopolitan uh, ideal is negative, destructive, 
nationalistic and uh, retrograde. And he says, uh, again, that cosmopolitanism is the only form of thinking about cultures and about peoples and about communities that's going to allow for long-term sustainable coexistence of people on our planet. What Kulmas then does is he goes on to describe, uh, to construct his history of cosmopolitanism. Now, it's a history of cosmopolitanism that is extremely uh, Eurocentric, um, but I'll just give you the uh, outline as it goes. He basically sees the high points of cosmopolitan thinking, right, those ideals that I described uh, earlier, as occurring at certain privileged moments in history, and what are they? They are the Greek Empire, the Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, the Carolingian uh, Empire, the French Empire, the Spanish Empire, the Austro-Hungarian, and uh, the uh, British. He does, of course, um, show an awareness of the particularly uh, unpleasant and destructive uh, downside of, for example, the French, Spanish, or uh, British empires. But what he sees is the defining quality of these empires is that they're multi-ethnic and they're multilingual, and in their various and different ways, uh, they try to uh, subscribe to some notion of the cosmopolitan uh, ideal. This version of cosmopolitanism that situates its privileged moments in either the experience of empire or of large nations, which were formerly imperial nations, I will describe as the macro-cosmopolitan perspective. The macro-cosmopolitan perspective, empire, large nation-state that was formerly imperial, or a large supranational organization or federal structure, such, such as the European uh, Union, is the one that's consistently celebrated in uh, Kulmas' uh, book. If you like, for the macro-cosmopolitan, it is only large political units which are capable of allowing the development of a progressive and inclusive view of uh, humanity, even if he acknowledges that sometimes um, these uh, empires and large nations and federal structures uh, don't behave in the way that they should and don't conform to the cosmopolitan uh, ideal. However, small nations, ethnic groups or uh, communities um, are primarily concerned with the protection and preservation of cultural uh, identity. Former colonies which, if you like, subscribe to an ideology of uh, national uh, liberation or cultural nationalism are, of course, deeply, deeply suspect for uh, Kulmas uh, with his macroscopic conception of uh, cosmopolitanism. The evidence of his rightness in this, he, he would argue, is you look at what happened in the Balkans, you look at what happened on my own uh, island over 30 years and more, and he says this is what happens when uh, the macro cosmopolitans aren't uh, running the, uh, the show. At one point, Kumas talks about that motto, small is uh, beautiful. And he associates it with a kind of a tendency in contemporary society uh, to celebrate local costumes, uh, local uh, dances, and uh, local languages. Um, his verdict on all of this is very clear. He says, this nostalgic looking back is clearly opposed to the onward march of history towards larger political uh, entities. But worse still, he says, at one point, the small state continues to be praised. End of quote. These small states, however, in this perspective, do have a particular role to play 
and it's described in the chapter dealing with the uh, great metropolises in history, the great cities, the great sort of multi-ethnic and multilingual cities in, in, in history. Um, these metropolises benefit from the arrival of immigrants from these smaller uh, states and political uh, units. In what way? He says, by means of this brain drain, many brilliant minds escape from their country of origin, particularly small countries offering few possibilities. Um, of course, he's not alone in thinking this. Um, in a book that I'm going to say more about uh, tomorrow, Raymond Williams' book, uh, Culture, um, when he looks at the history of artistic modernism in the 20th century, uh, Williams argued that it was crucially uh, immigrants to uh, the metropolis, not only from outlying regions, but from other and smaller national cultures, which created the kind of ferment, the kind of excitement, the kind of cultural creativity uh, that uh, led to uh, modernism in the uh, 20th century. If we look back to the 19th century, to uh, Matthew uh, Arnold, Arnold argued that it was precisely the pull of the center, the kind of centripetal pull of the, the center, uh, that made, for example, the notion of separate nationhood for the Irish or the Scots or the Bretons uh, a dangerous uh, illusion. Uh, and if I can quote uh, Arnold, he says, small nationalities uh, gravitate towards larger nationalities in their immediate uh, neighborhood. Their ultimate fusion is so natural and irresistible that even the sentiment of the absorbed race ceases with time to struggle against it. The Cornish man and the Breton have become at last in feeling as well as in political fact an Englishman and a Frenchman. And of course, crucially, um, what Mark Arnold is not mentioning, which is there as a political subtext, is linguistic uh, assimilation. Um, the 19th century Swiss uh, writer, uh, Rodolphe uh, Topfer, um, talked about how, for someone uh, on the outside the, 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 the metropolis, that the only way your work could be uh, consecrated was uh, through the metropolis, where, if you like, uh, judgments were then internalized by those on the uh, metropolitan edge. It's what they often say about rock groups, that the rock group has got to leave the small country to go to London or to New York, and then when they come back, uh, everybody raves about them in the uh, country of uh, departure. What uh, Dubfair says, it is absolutely necessary that if this man, a writer, wishes to be famous, he must bring his trashy talent to the capital, that there he must lay it out before the Parisian experts, a Swiss French writer, pay for their valuation, and then a reputation is concocted for him, which goes from the capital into the provinces where it is accepted with enthusiasm. And one wonders whether, in fact, and we can talk about this afterwards, um, whether in terms of translational politics um, the English language has not become a kind of free-floating metropolis in terms of what kinds of texts get translated and what, what don't, but we can, we can talk about that uh, later. So if you like, in the view that's described by Williams, the, what's described by Toffer, although for Toffer in an, an ironic uh, fashion, but by, by Kulmas, and by many, many others, is that what small countries do, smaller political units, is that they're a kind of pre-cosmopolitan nursery, a kind of bépinière, um, where, if you like, um, or a kind of a warehouse where you get these kind of cognitive uh, raw uh, materials um, which await uh, the kind of necessary processing and polish of uh, the uh, present and former capitals of uh, empires. If I've referred to Kulmas um, on a kind of number of occasions, um, it's because he offers a very nice kind of summary of some of the basic pieces of what I call this uh, macro uh, cosmopolitanism. Um, but what he expresses also is you know, an abiding sort of hostility, which he shares with many others, um, to anything that can be seen to define itself in terms of sovereignty or cultural 
uh, particularism. So what I would like to propose um, this, I never know what to say this afternoon or this evening, I suppose it's afternoon gradually uh, moving into to evening, which is why struggling against sleep can be a, a gargantuan task at various points. Um, but it's, uh, I would like to propose a notion of um, micro cosmopolitanism, which um, I'm opposing strategically to uh, macro uh, cosmopolitanism. Oh, we'll see later how these things can, can flow into each other. Um, macro cosmopolitan thought would share a number of macro cosmopolitan ideals. In other words, the notion of freedom, the notion of openness, the notion of respect, the notion of uh, tolerance, respect for others, and uh, so on. But it's crucially different in the site of its operation, the location of where it, it happens, and the way in which it foregrounds other perspectives, other areas of inquiry. Um, and above all, it seems to me, in freeing um, the notion or theory of cosmopolitanism from and a historical vision and a set of ideological uh, assumptions um, that threaten, it seems to me, many cosmopolitan uh, ideals uh, as a necessary element of human uh, self-understanding. And it also limits, it seems to me, the ability of cosmopolitan theory in its present macro form to speak to people in many different and varied uh, situations. So why do we need, if you like, uh, a microcosm? microcosmopolitan perspective, and what does it uh, consist of? Let me begin by the need, it seems to me, for such a uh, perspective. If we look at the situation that prevails on our planet today, we have now more nation states than at any other time in the history of the, uh, the globe. None of these uh, nations seems politically very intent on dispensing with their independence or with their uh, sovereignty. Now, I'm not talking about the economic realities of their situation, but certainly politically, there doesn't seem to be any great uh, rush uh, to do this. Even, for example, when people are transferring political powers to a federal structure such as the European Union, um, it, this is still articulated in terms of uh, notions of political independence and uh, sovereignty. If we look at what's happening in Tibet, if we've seen the uh, appalling events in, in, in Russia of, uh, of late, we see that struggles around questions of sovereignty and independence are still very live uh, issues in uh, countries such as Tibet and uh, Chechnya. So it seems in this kind of context um, that it is fairly unlikely that these uh, small new uh, nations, who often with great difficulty have freed themselves from the circumstances in which they uh, found themselves, are going to be uh, particularly impressed by being told that the whole notion of uh, distinctness, of particularism, uh, is outdated and reactionary and that clinging to uh, any notion around this automatically excludes them uh, de jure and de facto uh, from participation in uh, any notion of the cosmopolitan uh, ideal. It seems to me there's a very dangerous and fatal consequence of, of doing this. In other words, what you do is you set up a kind of progressive cosmopolitanism in opposition to a kind of bigoted essentialist nationalism uh, where, if you like, the latter has absolutely no place for the uh, former. In other words, the inhabitants of uh, the smaller uh, political units find themselves subject uh, to what Gregory Bateson famously called uh, the double bind in his attempt to explain the origins of uh, schizophrenia, the kind of idea that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you uh, don't. Uh, in other words, that you either abandon any form of uh, national sp specific uh, identification, which is associated with the worst forms of kind of irredentist uh, prejudice, and you embrace the cosmopolitan uh, credo, 
or you persist with a claim of national specificity and you place yourself outside the cosmopolitan pale, being by definition incapable of openness to the, uh, the other. It seems to me the effects of this kind of double bind are extraordinarily uh, damaging. Just as Bateson described the, the paralyzing effect of this on, the, social, on the, the, the psychic life of the people that he was uh, describing, it seems to me that uh, this kind of double bind is similarly uh, crippling and paralyzing a lot of cultural analysis, and I think this also applies to the uh, translation uh, domain. Because extreme nationalists of all uh, hues take refuge in virulent denunciations of anything that's construed to represent the cosmopolitan uh, ideal. We've only to look at the uh, tragic history of anti-Semitism in 20th century Europe to see how that uh, worked, the kind of, uh, this association that was made between uh, Jews and Jewishness and uh, the cosmopolitan. While the proponents of macro-cosmopolitanism are trenchantly hostile to any movement of thought that might appear to harbor sympathy for specificity or particularism. Another version of this kind of dualism, I think, can be found in uh, certain kinds or types of globalization uh, theory. If you like, globalization is very often presented by its, uh, its opponents, those who are, who are hostile to, to versions of, of globalization, as basically kind of process of whole-scale standardization, of homogenization, that you know, every high street in Europe or throughout the world begins to look the same. It's the same kind of retail uh, shops. It's the same McDonald's. Uh, it's the same chain of supermarket stores, uh, etc. It's what I've described in the globalization book as the notion of globalism as colonialism uh, rather than colonialism. In other words, that it's, it's a kind of doubling. It's a replication of, of the same over and over and over uh, again. In this vision of globalization, uh, the process is dominated by uh, multinational corporations and international organizations such as the World Bank, the IMF, etc. And all this is at the behest of the kind of political grand master, uh, the uh, United uh, States. Now this thesis, um, and I'm giving a slightly sort of, um, what to say, uh, a parodic uh, version, a more an extreme version, but this has been challenged by a number of theoreticians on uh, globalization, uh, such as Roland Robertson, Manuel uh, Castells, and Johnson Friedman, who see, in fact, uh, globalization as uh, a process that is much a kind of fragmentary and centrifugal force, kind of moving uh, outwards, breaking up Right, encouraging those tendencies as it is to a kind of centripetal, standardizing, homogenizing uh, force. Their analyses, on the face of it, would seem to uh, challenge the hegemony of the powerful. But in their kind of analyses, they do not, uh, at some level, uh, offer smaller uh, political uh, units a, a particularly promising role as what's happening in this kind of view of the kind of centrifugal or fragmentary notion of globalization is that the role of um, particular uh, ethnic communities, of uh, cultural specificity, um, of uh, smaller political units asserting the right to political independence is that they act as a kind of essentialist counterweight uh, to the standardizing effects of globalization in its centripetal uh, form. Alain Finkelkart, in his uh, book La Défaite de la, la, la Pensée, argues that one of the fatal things that happened to so many uh, nation states in the post-colonial period was that they became victims of what he called la logique identitaire, 
of identity logic. Um, what he meant by that was that in identity logic, uh, political and cultural differences are reduced to a simple and homogenous version of the particular. And this usually favors the social and economic interests of local elites in these uh, countries. So it's kind of an analysis I think has been uh, rehearsed uh, many uh, times. So if you like, as somebody um, who comes from uh, a place which is often presented as an example of that sort of centrifugal uh, force in the contemporary uh, world, but where over 3,000 people um, died uh, in often very violent uh, and tragic ways in a conflict around notions of identity, around notions of difference, around notions of the, uh, the particular. Um, you've got to uh, ask yourself um, whether the binaries of macrocosmopolitan thinking, which also seem to me to underlie uh, some of the work that's been uh, done by uh, Benjamin Barber in his book uh, uh, Jihad versus the Mac World, or Samuel Huntington's thesis on the clash of civilizations. It seems to me those sort of binary uh, oppositions are obviously ones that one's going to take very seriously because you see what the consequences are of particular kinds of identity uh, logics. Microcosmopolitan thinking, for me, is an approach um, which does not involve a kind of stark opposition of uh, smaller political units with larger political units, whether they be national or uh, transnational but one which in the general context of the cosmopolitan ideals that I've mentioned uh, earlier, seeks to diversify or to complexify uh, the uh, local uh, or the smaller uh, units. In other words, it's a cosmopolitanism from below rather than a cosmopolitanism from uh, above. What I want to, in other words, suggest to you uh, here is that it's possible to have um, a notion of difference that is within rather than beyond uh, the political unit. And the translation is going to be one of the ways of thinking about difference within rather than beyond uh, political uh, units. And what I would like to do uh, to be in order to kind of describe some of the ways in which you might think about this, um, I want to, to borrow one or two um, ideas from work that I did on uh, travel writing this book uh, across the, uh, the lines. Um, in this book, at one point, I talk about the notion of fractal So what do I mean by that? In 1977, the French mathematician uh, Benoit uh, Mandelbrot wrote an article with a very simple title. He says, how long is the coast of Britain? So it seemed on the face it to be very simple. If you can imagine an enormous measuring tape and you just sort of measure. Uh, put it over the, the line of the coast, and you get the uh, length of uh, the coast of Britain. But what um, mathematicians found, and geographers, when they began to do that, is that each time you came to a stretch of, of coast, um, that as you went down to the smaller and smaller fragments of the, uh, the coast, uh, each of these fragments showed the same level of complexity and irregularity as the, the larger ones. So that meant you can imagine your tape, your, your sort of tape measure, um, that you then, where you thought was going to be a straight, straight line, was in fact yet another uh, crooked line with all kinds of tiny little bays and inlets and coves and so on. Um, 
So what Mondelbrot came up with was the notion of a fractal geometry, which was basically a geometry which took as its basic assumption that irrespective of the scale, whether you went from the macroscopic to the infinitesimally uh, microscopic, that you were getting the same degree of complexity, right? the same degree of irregularity from the, micro the macroscopic to the, uh, the microscopic. In the case of this particular book, I was applying that notion to travel, that someone who views, if you like, a landscape from a, a helicopter is going to see a certain number of things. Um, what will appear to them to be fairly homogenous from the helicopter uh, will, to someone on a bicycle, appear more varied and more complex. Um, what appears to someone on the bicycle as fairly homogenous, just goes by in, in a flash, they hardly see it, becomes very visible to someone who is walking. In other words, uh, the degrees of, of, of complexity are there at, at all uh, levels. And what I was arguing... Um, for this against what I called the kind of discourse of exhaustion on travel writing, the idea that uh, because between 1900, for example, and 1945, uh, there were 320 travel books published about Ireland, that there's really no point in going there anymore if you're an English language writer, because by Jesus, everybody had written about the place. Um, but in fact, what this fractal differentialism suggests is that as you go down from the macroscopic to the microscopic, that, that complexity, complexity remains constant, but also that the microscopic and the, the local has a degree of complexity that's comparable to that of the uh, macroscopic. To give you one example of how this works in practice, um, a man called Tim Robinson, who is an English mathematician and cartographer from wrote a book a number of years ago called The Stones of Aaron, a labyrinth. Um, Aaron is, or uh, Aaron Moore, is the largest of the three Aran islands that are off the west coast of uh, Ireland. It's an extremely important uh, site, if you like, of cultural nationalism in Ireland because it was seen during the late 19th century by sort of urban intellectuals from, uh, from the city, from, from Dublin, as a place in which, if you like, um, people spoke Irish, they practiced uh, authentic folk uh, customs, uh, and so on. It was, if you like, um, the kind of the sacred repository or site of the, the nation. And I think in many national histories you'll find similar places which get hallowed in this, in this way. But what Robinson found when he, uh, and, you know, God bless his socks, he certainly was methodical about this, he went through the 14,000 fields um, on the... Uh, on Arnmore uh, Island and explored um, the history uh, of these fields, uh, the names, the mythologies associated with them, and, and so on. In other words, in what would seem this restricted and confined space, what he was opening up was an extraordinary kind of uh, fractal uh, complexity. But also what was interesting is that as he went down into what I call the kind of fractally uh, complex, he found multiple traces of uh, languages and cultures from outside of uh, Ireland, whether it was Cromwellian soldiers who come in the 17th century to, uh, to live on the uh, island, uh, whether it was traders coming from uh, North Africa, whether it was uh, merchants coming from uh, Portugal, Spain, France, and, and so on. So, if you like, that this sort of hallowed uh, site of national particularism um, showed through uh, Robinson's ex uh, exploration to be one that was uh, inscribed again kind of multiple traces of uh, translation and contact with other cultures and uh, languages.
It seems to me that a notion of the uh, microcosmopolitan is something that helps to free us from the kind of terminal paralysis of uh, identity uh, logic, um, but not so much through a kind of programmatic condemnation of uh, elites ruling from above, but through a kind of patient undermining of conventional thinking from uh, below. Um, I think also a microcosmopolitan perspective is something that avoids the kind of ready assimilation of cosmopolitanism to economic and social uh, privilege, um, which is apparent not only in the kind of tirades of uh, European neo-fascists, you know, the idea that cosmopolitanism is uh, part of a conspiracy by the capitalist uh, class and international jury to uh, remove uh, economic wealth from oppressed peoples and uh, so on, so that, that kind of neo-fascist you know, uh, argument. But you also get it on the, the left of the political spectrum, where um, progressive uh, thinkers are often extremely skeptical about the uses to which cosmopolitanism and cosmopolitan thinking is put to um, by transnational uh, capital. I mean, one of the most sort of eloquent denunciations of that is a book by uh, Timothy Brennan called At Home in the World, Cosmopolitanism Now, a book came out in, in 1994, uh, uh, where he denounces this kind of current interest in the cosmopolitan and cosmopolitanism um, as simply, he would see it as a kind of well-meaning version of American uh, imperialism, which under the cover of the melting pot and cultural pluralism and multiculturalism and so on, um, is seeking to ensure the continued dominance of its own political, economic and uh, military uh, interests. Um, Danilo Zolo, in a book called uh, Cosmopolis, Prospects for World Government, a very kind of 50s title, I know, Cosmopolis, Prospects for World Government, loads of books like that in the 1950s. Um, but he's, he's similarly very, very hostile. He says the following. What Western cosmopolitans call global civil uh, society, in fact, goes no further than a network of connections and functional interdependencies which have developed within certain important sectors of the global market. Above all, finance, uh, technology, automation, the manufacturing industry, and the service uh, sector. Nor, moreover, does it, much, does it go much beyond the optimistic expectation of affluent Westerners to be able to feel universally recognized as citizens of the world, citizens of a welcoming, peaceful, ordered, and democratic global uh, village, without for a moment or in any way ceasing to be themselves, that is, Western citizens. Right? So it's very classical, progressive, if you like, condemnation of what cosmopolitanism seems to be uh, uh, hiding. So, in other words, it seems to me that the what I call the micro-cosmopolitan moment is one that by situating diversity, difference, uh, exchange at the micro levels of uh, society challenges the kind of the monopoly, whether it's real or imaginary, of a kind of deracinated uh, elite on cosmopolitan uh, ideals by attempting to show that elsewhere is next door and in one's immediate uh, environment. Something I want to just to refer to briefly before I go on to look at the specific example of um, some translation history is that very often when people talk about cosmopolitanism, interculturalism, multiculturalism, and so on, as I will talk about uh, this uh, tomorrow, um, it's cities that are seen to be the exemplary kind of illustration of this. It's, it's in the urban center, it's in the city, it's um, that we find this uh, happening. Um, Sherry Simon, my translation theory in, in a book on called L'hybridité uh, culturelle, writes about the Mile End district of Montreal and she's, you know, she talks about the various uh, different cultural, religious, uh, ethnic influences uh, in this uh, area and how it if you like, encapsulates the, what you see as the, the, the multicultural 
uh, spirit of the, uh, the city. But it seems to me that when we do that, one of the dangers is we set up a kind of an opposition between you know, the progressive cosmopolitanism of the urban center versus the kind of uh, kind of reactionary, you know, patriotisme du terroir of uh, the countryside, or the small town, or uh, the land, um, or the you know the area outside the uh, the large uh, urban um, centre, and this means that you know one of the kind of the eternal tropes of extreme forms of, of nationalism, you know, is hailing back to this notion of, of soil, of rootedness, and, and so on, using its kind of rural uh, images. Um, and one of the things that a microcosmopolitan perspective, it seems to me, will allow us to do is to look at traces of translation, translatability, uh, sites of translation uh, activity, uh, and this kind of fractal complexity in all kinds of sites and not just the large urban metropolitan uh, sites. So, if we um, look at the specific example then of um, translation history, and the, uh, the, the Irish case. I just want to give some uh, examples, and I hope in the discussion afterwards we can see examples from uh, other uh, countries. Um, Jared Delante, who's written an excellent book called Citizenship in uh, a Global uh, Age, um, at one point in his book, he defines what he calls the cosmopolitan moment. He says the cosmopolitan moment is, occurs when context-bound cultures encounter each other and undergo transformation as a result. So context-bound cultures encounter each other and undergo transformation as a result. He says only in this way can the twin pitfalls of the false universalism of liberalism's universalistic morality and the communitarian retreat into the particular be avoided. And so the cosmopolitan moment is one where, on the one hand, you don't subscribe to some kind of notion of the universal, in which you would you know, subscribe the same uh, ideas and concepts to, uh, to everyone, but nor would you have the notion of uh, community and ethnic identity being the be-all and end-all of uh, everything. For Delante, what is absolutely crucial in the cosmopolitan moment is the interaction between what he calls the local and the transnational. Um, hence, he's extremely interested, for example, in potential political alliances between different cities, po potential political alliances between different regions, rather than the traditional or conventional alliances between nation states. What I would like to do um, now is to suggest that one of the extremely fruitful ways that we have of linking the microcosmopolitan to the, the transnational uh, is by way of translation uh, history. And already in a number of the conversations I've had with people uh, around the, 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 the table, you know, I can see the way in which this uh, can work its, its way out. Um, one of the things I think which characterized uh, translation history in its, um, its earlier phases, and I think that I, you know, if I think back to my first book, Translating Ireland, I think I was sort of guilty of it myself, is a tendency to consider translation activity within the borders of the nation state or the political uh, unit that you, ha you happen to be uh, studying. Uh, in other words, concentrating very much on the kind of translation activity that was going on in the country or national unit that you were uh, describing. The problem about that is that it ignored a dimension to translation which seems to me to be terribly important in so many different uh, cultures, national and supranational. And, you know, Anthony has, 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 has written about this. Um, which is the diasporic or the transnational. In other words, one can always ask the question, 
whether to some extent we can ever really talk about national histories of translation and whether in fact by very definition of the object of our study they are transnational. They, 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 they have to be almost implicitly or by uh, definition. So what I want to do is to give you just three uh, brief examples of um, how this uh, can happen in the case of uh, one particular country, um, Ireland. So, uh, which might be described, if you like, as cosmopolitan, but microcosmopolitan uh, moments, where you're getting this, this sort of interface between the local and the uh, transnational. The first is the uh, medieval. Uh, period where from the 7th century onwards you're getting what's called the Peregrinatio uh, per Amore Dei, the pilgrimage for the love of God. Some cynics would say it was a pilgrimage in search of better weather, um, but Irish monks took off in large numbers uh, from their rain-swept island and went to continental uh, Europe where uh, they set up many uh, monastic uh, foundations. They literally ran into the, the hundreds um, from uh, Brittany to uh, Kiev. One of their main functions, if you like, in all of this was um, the reconstruction of the educational system uh, for the Merovingian and the Carolingian empires. One of the things that the Merovingians and the Carolingians wanted to do was to reconstruct a kind of an educational infrastructure um, which had gone into uh, decline uh, during, after the, uh, the fall of, 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 of Rome. So the, uh, these Irish monks, if you like, were sort of uh, foot soldiers uh, in this attempt. One of the crucial aspects of that was, of course, using Latin as a kind of a linguistic glue to hold uh, the Merovingian and the Carolingian kingdoms to, 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 together. Uh, why did the Irish get involved in this? Um, Latin, because the Irish spoke uh, Irish Gaelic, a Celtic language, uh, Latin for them was an utterly foreign language. They, 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 you know, for them, they, they had to approach it as uh, an object that was, by definition, uh, foreign. One of the effects of this was that um, the first pedagogic grammars of Latin are produced by these Irish monks. Because at this stage, if you like, for a lot of the children and uh, young adults they're going to teach, Latin has become a, a foreign uh, language. Um, so they need to acquire it in the way, uh, in a kind of a coherent, systematic, pedagogical way. Whereas a lot of the grammars that were produced in antiquity were kind of examples there weren't so much formal systematic descriptions of the language as examples of the right way to speak uh, or you know, samples from the best authors and uh, so on. Um, so what happens then is these monks coming from very small, uh, geographically isolated, geographically scattered uh, monastic communities on the western seaboard of, of Europe, uh, are going to be uh, involved in the Carolingian Renaissance. And through the translation activities of a particularly prominent group of ninth century uh, translators, such as Johannes Scotus Eugena, uh, Sedulius Scotus, and, and others, um, they would be responsible for the introduction of Neoplatonism into, uh, sort of into European uh, thought. And that would be would be one of the things um, sort of driving the, sort of the, uh, the revival of learning in the, uh, the 12th century, or what some people refer to as the kind of the, the mini-Renaissance, the pre-Renaissance, or, uh, or whatever. Um, but what's significant about this moment is the traffic, of course, was going both ways. Hmm? That the, the, the transnational was feeding into the local, and the local was feeding into the uh, transnational. Uh, the second moment that I wanted to mention, particularly because it uh, directly relates to um, where José Lambert teaches, is the role of uh, Leuven. Um, St. Anthony's College, which was um, opened in Leuven in 1603, 
became a center for one of the most important centers of translation activity for the Irish. Remember that with the 1540s, with the reconquest of Ireland, uh, the bringing in of the reformed uh, religion, uh, Catholicism becomes uh, a banned uh, religion. Uh, many of the priests have to leave the country to be educated in other countries in Europe. This is why we get the Collège des Irlandais in Paris. This is why we get the Irish College in Salamanca. This is why we get St. Anthony's College in, in Leuven. Um, so what Leuven becomes is, on the one hand, uh, an important part of the kind of the transnational uh, organization of the Counter-Reformation, because texts are being translated into, uh, into Irish Gaelic. They're being sent up to Scotland. Uh, intelligence reports about the state of people's uh, political and religious, religious and theological beliefs are being sent from Scotland to Leuven. They're being translated into Latin or into Italian, They're sent to uh, Rome, and uh, so on. Um, but all this translation activity into Irish causes the dramatic uh, alteration of the language from what we call uh, the classical uh, form to uh, what's called uh, modern, early modern uh, Irish. So this translation activity is feeding into, if you like, the, the, the transnational, the, the way in which the, the church is, is, is operating at the, uh, the time, but it's also affecting you know, huge effects in the way the language is going to be written in the local uh, point of uh, departure. The third uh, moment is post-independence. Um, not everybody enjoyed the post-independence party. Um, what happened was uh, precisely the kind of uh, difficulty that was described by Finkelkart and others, which was the triumph of identity logic. In other words, the state, after independence, promoted the notion of the only authentic form of Irishness was to be Catholic, was to be Gaelic-speaking, uh, was preferably to have a small farm in the west of Ireland, uh, and that anybody who did not belong to uh, these categories was not truly uh, Irish. What it meant in terms of, of literature was the favoring of very conventional or traditional forms of, of narrative that would kind of tell the heroic story of uh, Ireland's uh, oppression. Um, Joyce had already sensed that this was going to, 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 to happen. You know, he'd, he'd left uh, the country. But then in the 1930s, Samuel Beckett uh, goes into exile. He goes to, to Paris. The whole series of uh, other poets, um, Dennis Devlin, Brian Coffey, Thomas uh, McCreevy, um, who are crucial in creating and contributing to um, you know, what's referred to as uh, high modernism or aesthetic modernism in uh, European uh, literature. So they, if you like, they're, they're part of that sort of uh, transnational uh, movement in uh, writing and culture. But of course, the fact of their, and all of these, of course, are translators. Translation is very, uh, less so in the case of Joyce, but certainly in the case of Beckett and the others, is a very important dimension to their activity. And it's that activity that then is going to feed the kind of the counter uh, revolution in the 1960s um, with the sort of redevelopment of the modernist tradition in uh, writing on the island of Ireland uh, itself. Another um, aspect to this that I should just mention very, very briefly, because it often gets um, ignored, is um, the role of uh, the Irish in uh, missionary activity in uh, many parts of the world, particularly in Latin America and in Africa, which involved uh, linguistic activity, which involved translation activity, uh, which meant, if you like, that in a sense there was no part of the place, however small or local, that did not have a kind of a contact with someone or with a person or people in very many different parts of the globe. So to this, um, very often to this uh, missionary 
uh, activity. Um, so what I would like to sort of um, take from uh, these different uh, movements is that micro-cosmopolitan transnationalism um, is arguing not that a sense of place or a sense of identity be dissolved into a kind of rootless, uh, free-floating uh, geography of kind of uh, diasporic fragments just floating uh, here and uh, there. But rather that we look at transnational phenomena like translation to reinvest places uh, with a full sense of their connectedness and their uh, complexity. Uh, and th those places, no matter how small. In the words of uh, Alastair McIntosh, who was a S Scottish activist and uh, academic, well, he was an academic until he lost his job in the University of uh, Edinburgh for suggesting uh, a bit too vocally and strongly that uh, oil companies were doing a lot of damage to the Scottish ecosystem. So all of a sudden, uh, the university, which is receiving substantial funds from the, uh, some of the oil companies, decided that it wasn't a terribly good idea to have this man and his eco-center there. So uh, he was, his contract was uh, terminated. But, um, but McIntosh says the, the, the following. He says, if any of us dig deep enough where we stand, we will find ourselves uh, connected to all parts of the, uh, the world. Um, and I think it's in the context uh, of this in the context of the kind of micro-cosmopolitan commitment to the complexity of the, uh, the local, that we should look perhaps again at the connection between particularism and uh, universality. The problem is that particularism is easily parodied. It tends to get a kind of a bad uh, press um, because to be concerned about specific places or peoples or uh, cultures um, can very easily appear to be limiting, it can be, appear to be narcissistic, um, and it's much less attractive than a kind of an abstract universal compassion for you know, all peoples, all cultures, uh, all places, and uh, so on. And it's just in this uh, context that I would like to um, cite a philosopher, a um, kind of feminist philosopher called Val Plumwood, um, who argues that our care for or our empathy with specific aspects of nature, for example, uh, rather than with nature as an abstraction, in other words, to be concerned with specific aspects of it rather than with it as kind of an abstract uh, whole, is absolutely vital if there's to be any substance or content to our commitment or our concern, to be any kind of a substance or validity uh, to it. Um, she says, for example, that care and responsibility for particular animals, trees, uh, and rivers that are well-known, loved, and appropriately connected to the self are an important basis for acquiring a more generalized uh, concern. What she argues is that the kind of major drawback with finding particular attachments to be somehow kind of ethically uh, suspect uh, and where you advocate in, in, instead a kind of a, a genuine impartial identification uh, with nature or the good, however you might uh, define that, is that you could end up favoring a kind of in indiscriminate uh, identification um, which undermines the basis for your concern in the first place, i.e. the desire to preserve uh, difference. Plumman says, says the following. This transpersonal identification, kind of impartial transpersonal identification, is so indiscriminate and intent on denying particular meanings, it cannot allow for the deep and highly particularistic attachment to place that has motivated both the passion of many modern conservationists and the love of many indigenous peoples for their land. And you might also, I think, uh, add uh, languages. So if we transfer our attention from uh, biodiversity to what's called uh, cultural uh, ecology, um, it seems to me that it's possible to measure 
the particular importance of scholarship that is focused on a specific uh, place, but which is equally alert to the news from uh, elsewhere, to quote one of uh, Seamus um, Heaney's poems. Um, in a sense, it seems to me that what uh, Plumwood is uh, intuiting here is that a kind of microcosmopolitanism of um, the local uh, rather than the kind of the macro cosmopolitanism that is conventionally associated with the, the, the notion might allow for the emergence of a theory, theories of translation and a cultural politics um, which is crucially re-centred but is not ultimately self-centred. So on that point I'll uh, stop because I think I've been speaking for a, a, an hour which I think is more than anybody should be asked to listen to at this, this hour of uh, the, the evening or afternoon. Um, so if you uh, have any queries or uh, comments on...